A reading from the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, for your sake I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars and the shouting of the Chaldeans will be turned to lamentation. I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the creator of Israel, your King. Thus says Yahweh, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise. They are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I have formed for myself, so that they might declare my praise. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. They gave, him a, di they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii? and the money given to the poor. He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of Christ. On this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, we do see that we are now beginning our transition from the season of Lent towards Holy Week. Next week is Palm Sunday, and Holy Week, though technically still part of the season of Lent, is, for all intents and purposes, really its own thing as we set up looking forward to Easter Sunday. And the fact that this transition is beginning now is reflected in the readings that we've been given today. You might have gathered in reading them that they don't quite as easily fit the theme we've been exploring over the past four weeks. We started off on the first Sunday of Lent about choosing to identify ourselves with Jesus in his own baptism and hearing those words, you are my child, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And then each week after that, we talked about how God's love is shown to us in our darkness and despite our darkness and even in the darkness that we think is light. But now, on this Sunday, the readings we have force us to move forward towards Passion Week itself. It's said in the Gospel reading this morning that it was the six days before the Passover, and we read this episode where Jesus is at the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus and having dinner, and Mary uh, breaks this jar of costly perfume over his feet, anointing his feet. And after that episode is over, very quickly it's suddenly the triumphal entry. So, so basically, today's reading should be this coming Saturday, with the next day being Palm Sunday. So we're right on the cusp of Holy Week. But in looking at these readings this morning, I think it's helpful for us to consider what they've done in the lectionary, putting this passage from Isaiah together with the Gospel of John. How did these two readings come together? Because what we read from the prophet doesn't sound at all like anything to do with what we read in the gospel. And so let's just review for a moment what it is that we heard in the reading from the Hebrew Bible. It opens up, first of all, from the prophet speaking on behalf of God. Now, 
Let me say, with the book of Isaiah itself, it's 66 chapters long, but it's divided up really into at least two parts. The first 39 chapters of the book would be just before Israel is finally defeated by the Babylonians and carried off into exile. And these would be the things that the prophet Isaiah himself would have said and recorded. But once you get to chapter 40 and onward, you're now into a section that is often called Second Isaiah, and it is taking place during the exile when Babylon is about to be defeated. So several decades have gone by. And now we start to see a completely different flavor of language being used and how things are being described. And then the last 10 chapters even sound like a third voice yet again, and sometimes it's even called third Isaiah, and it's talking about what has happened after the exile. So in this large prophetic book, we see this progress being made once again through an understanding of what's going on and what God's role is in it. So when we read this passage now, the exile is underway. The people of Israel have been taking away, taken away from their land for some time, and they're living in Babylon away from everything that was ever familiar to them. And then the people who are understanding what God is saying says they say this, Thus says Yahweh, your Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, I am Yahweh, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. In these two verses... God is identifying himself, and again, in the Hebrew Bible, God was understood to be a male deity. God is identifying himself, Yahweh is identifying himself in a couple of curious ways. First of all, the Redeemer. Redeeming has its origin in setting someone who is a slave free. That's what the word redemption comes from, and that's what it means to redeem something. It's not about redeeming coupons. It's instead taking a slave and setting them free. And so by identifying himself in this way, Yahweh is reminding Israel that he is the one that was responsible for taking them out of slavery in Egypt and bringing them into the promised land. Here they are now in exile, kind of like a similar situation, and Yahweh is saying, just remember, I'm the Redeemer which is a bit of a hint of what could be coming around the corner here. The, Yahweh also says, not only am I your holy one and the creator of Israel, I am your king, which is interesting that Yahweh would say that. And part of the reason why is because at this point, Israel doesn't have a king. They don't have anything. They don't have a land anymore. They don't have a capital city. They don't have a temple. They're in exile. There's no king anymore. The kings are done. Zedekiah was the last king and he's done. There's, there's no king over Israel. And so God says, understand that I am your king. One could argue that that had never actually changed, that it had always been the case that God had been the king of Israel. But nevertheless, in this passage, it's being reminded, you don't have a human king. There's no King David on the throne right now at all. But understand that I am your king. And so the people are hearing from God and understanding what God has intending, is intending to do here with this reminder of having been the redeemer in the past and having been the king all along. And what is the promise that is made to them? Well, he says, for your sake, I will send to Babylon and break down all the bars and the shouting of the Chaldeans will be turned to lamentation. What that means is this, the people who have taken Israel captive and in the earlier half, in 1st Isaiah, if you will, the prophet was saying that the reason this is going to happen is because God is using Babylon as a way to discipline us because we were disobedient and so on. What is going to happen now is Babylon itself is going to receive its just desserts for the way that it had been cruel and evil and doing all sorts of bad things, not only to Israel, but to other peoples as well. And what happens shortly after this statement is made is the Persian Empire takes over the Babylonian Empire. And so Babylon receives its comeuppance as well. But this is where it's being announced to Israel. The people under whose thumb you are living, there'll be, there'll be a change in management coming up. Let me assure you of that. But then God goes on and he says, understand uh, that you are not to remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, do you not perceive it? This new thing that's being talked about is what I just described, this changing of the empires. 
But it's interesting that prior to making that announcement, God says, don't think about the former things. Don't remember uh, the things of old. Don't keep looking back in that way, which is a curious thing to have Yahweh say to the people of Israel because that was always their practice. Every time through the history of Israel, there's a major change. A new chapter is beginning in their history. They would be led to reflect on what God had done in the past and how God had been faithful as a reminder that they should expect that God will be faithful in the future too. That's always been part of their package to look back. Why would God say they shouldn't do that anymore? Well, It isn't that God is saying that they shouldn't do that, that they shouldn't reflect on God's faithfulness in the past. I mean, after all, God does that by saying, I'm your redeemer, that that automatically makes them think about their slavery in Egypt, right? So it isn't that they aren't to look back at the faithfulness of God. What they are not to do is look back to the good old days, which, of course, is really easy for anybody to do, and we do it all the time, don't we? Here they are languishing in exile, no land, no capital city, no temple, and no king. And you can bet there are people going like, you know, I remember when the golden age of Israel was when David was on the throne. We were united. Everything was great. If only it could be like that. That is what God is saying. Don't dwell on that anymore. Don't look back to that. Look, I'm doing a new thing. Do you not perceive it? This new thing in this literal representation of this word is that there is going to be a change and the Persians take over the Babylonians. However, we are able to see this statement, I am doing a new thing, do you not perceive it, and see it applied again and again in future events that are coming. After Persia takes over, it is Persia that enables the Israelites to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild the city and rebuild the walls and rebuild the temple. That is a new thing. Suddenly the exile is going to be over. So that's coming up. But even though they rebuild that, they don't get a new king. Israel's reestablished in the promised land, but they're not under the rule of a king. That's different. God's doing something new. Now, the Roman Empire ends up on the scene, and they install a king, but King Herod, though he's Jewish, is really more of a puppet to the Romans, so even that's kind of new. And then, of course, when Jesus emerges, it's a new thing all the more, because Jesus is always saying, you know, this is how things were said back then. Here's what I'm saying to you now. Um, these are, this is the direction we're moving into. And then even with the announcement of Jesus' death, which he would say from time to time to his own disciples, they didn't perceive why that would be important. And even in our gospel reading today, the fact that Jesus had to point out that Mary has basically anointed Jesus for burial, he's bringing up this idea that he's going to die. Well, well, this doesn't make any sense to them. I say all of that simply to say that there's one new thing after another that we could see taking place in the history of Israel from the time that this promise is made in Isaiah. And the key is for their eyes to be open to understand what God is doing as they come through each of these episodes in their lives. For us this morning, I'm going to suggest that it's important for us to hold on to that same thought ourselves. Are we able to perceive what God is doing in our day and age today? Are we able to see that God is often doing something new? And if we allow ourselves to think always about the good old days, we're going to have a hard time seeing what the opportunities are down the road because of what God is doing. One of the most immediate things for us to consider is just pre-COVID and post-COVID, right? We can now talk about a new kind of BC date before COVID (laughs) and then after COVID, right? Um, What is going on? What does church look like? What does life look like? And so on. And if we're thinking that everything can just get back exactly the way it used to be, we might be missing what's going on. But before we spend much time on that, let me just bring out a point that I think is, is also important for us to grasp. When it comes to understanding how the Hebrew Bible speaks to us, We have to understand that we are seeing it speak to us when we take what is said in its pages and understand how it speaks to us metaphorically for our world today. Now, what do I mean by that? Isaiah chapter 43 was written to the Israelites in exile in Babylon 
before the Persians take over, and the new thing God was doing was going to be getting the Babylonians out and replacing them with the Persians. That is what that passage is about. That is what that prophecy is about. That is the literal meaning of that text. That's as far as it goes, if we just simply take it literally. And that would be correct. But what does that say to us? The literal meaning says nothing to us, really, except that obviously God had a plan and a purpose for the Israelites and he wanted to tell them what he was up to. And it's great, yeah, those, those empires changed. And that happened, you know, 2,500 years ago. What does that say to me now? It's the only way, the only way that this is going to say something to us is if we understand that we see something of the character of God in that, and the words that God gave to Israel are then useful to us by extension, seeing this episode in the life of Israel as a metaphor for what God might do down the road. And it can be a good idea to think that being able to take this metaphorically is far more helpful and meaningful for us than just looking at the literal meaning alone. John Dominic Crossan is a Catholic theologian who said that if he was ever given the choice between taking the literal meaning of something or the metaphorical meaning of something, he'd take the metaphor all the time, hands down. Now, why would he say that? What is the point of that? Why is this important? Well, let me look at it with you this way. We all live somewhere, right? We might be in a house or an apartment, a condo maybe, townhouse, whatever. Let's just say we all live in a house, even if you don't. Let's just say we all live in a house. A house literally is a wood frame structure with stucco, and, or maybe you've got a whole lot of you know, concrete in your design, whatever. It's this structure that's been put together, and a house is the place in which you reside. That is the literal meaning of your residence at whatever address it is that's yours. Really exciting, isn't it? There it is. That's the structure in which you live. But your home is a different thing, isn't it? When we talk about your home, that is a metaphorical word because it transcends the literal meaning of the structure in which you live. We're no longer simply talking about your residence, are we? We're talking about the place where you belong, the place that is yours, the place that conjures a sense of emotion and belonging and connectedness and even love and compassion. Or maybe if you had a difficult time, home might mean something else, but it means so much more than simply the place in which you live. When you go out to a restaurant and the food's really great, you never say, oh man, this tastes just like my residence. It's, no, it, this tastes just like home. Well, what does that mean? Usually it means, you know, this, this is the meal that my mom made and it tastes just like her cooking or whatever, right? Home is the metaphor, which makes the structure in which you live so much more significant than the fact that it's simply the structure in which you live. And it doesn't matter, like when you compare your residence to someone else's residence, it doesn't matter whether your place is a better structure than their place or bigger or smaller or whatever, it doesn't matter. The reason why this is home is because this is the place that is meaningful to you. And calling it your home is always far better than calling it the house where you live. In a similar way, the literal meaning of this text in and of itself only goes so far. But seeing the scriptures in this metaphorical way enables us now to see it come to life for us and apply it to our lives in a way that is conversant with the character of God revealed in this passage. So for today and moving forward, with this passage in mind then, and carrying on that metaphorical thought, what do we do with that? Well, we take that admonition not to always look back at the good old days, because those days are gone, and whatever is coming down the road is going to be different. We know that God was present back there, and God is always faithful, and that's great. So now, how is God going to demonstrate God's faithfulness in the episodes of our lives that are yet before us? Whatever it is that's going to happen, we're dealing with a new day, a new time, a new concept, a new situation, perhaps a new job. 
Perhaps it's a new residence in which you live, whatever. But the point is, God is still active, and God will be doing a new thing in that context. Do you perceive it? Are you able to see what God is up to? Because sometimes we have a hard time seeing that precisely because of what changes in our lives as we go. Our job is suddenly changed because suddenly after 17 years, we're no longer working at the same place anymore, just like that. Now what? God is doing a new thing. Can we see God in the middle of that? What comes next? A health problem comes upon us all of a sudden that we didn't see coming. And now we have to stay longer in a place that we had traveled to because we're in the hospital with a heart condition. What now? God is faithful. And God is doing a new thing in this new situation you find yourself. You see, whatever circumstance we might describe, whatever circumstance we might encounter, The reality is the God who is characterized by steadfast love to Israel in the pages of the Hebrew Bible is a God who is still characterized by steadfast love today. That's why we could spend the first four weeks of the season of Lent talking about God's love for us uh, through every episode of darkness we could possibly imagine. God's love is still displayed to us. And so as we move forward into the post-COVID time, yeah, I know COVID's not completely over with yet, but it looks like we're not having spikes, at least not in Alberta. Looks like things are going to open up a little bit more, and this is good, and we get to do things again, and we get to have social events and different things that we couldn't do before. It's opening up. It's never going to be exactly the same. But whatever we face, both the positive and the negative, the good and the bad, God's presence is there. And God is active. And we need to be ready to perceive what God is doing as we move forward. Maybe there's a passion week ahead for us. And I mean our own suffering, not just passion week next week. Whatever comes, God is at work. And God is at work on the basis of God's love for you, God's steadfast love for you that never changes. Amen.